Welcome to our Family Talk staff devotions. I'm the Director of Broadcast, Mike Segovia, here at Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. And um, we're so excited that you joined us today. Our special guest that we have leading our devotions is speaker and author Rhonda Stoppy. Uh, Rhonda has authored such books as Moms Raising Sons to Be Men and her new book, Real Life Romance, which will be released in February 2018. So be uh, on the lookout for that. Rhonda, thank you so much for leading our staff devotions today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here, and I have so much I want to say, so I'm going to jump right in. I wish I could sit here and tell you who I am and what I'm about, but I flew in last night from California, and um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, Can we just jump right in? Uh, D.L. Moody admired two paintings. One depicted a man amidst a storm firmly grasping a cross. The other of a man in a storm with one hand around the cross, and the other he was reaching to rescue someone who was about to drown. The first portrait represents 95% of Christians who admit that they have never led someone to faith in Jesus. For many, the idea of sharing the gospel is something that they want to do, but they're not sure how. For a number of years, that was my my story. Uh, I would have depicted the first painting where I was clutching to the cross, but I had never really told anyone uh, how to know Christ. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I was like, you know, praying about thinking about what is the thing that I, is most on my heart, and this is where I live. This is my passion, is to share the gospel. Uh, and what, what happened, my oldest daughter, when she was about 18 months old, she had to be in ICU. And while she was in ICU, uh, she they were afraid she was going to have brain, brain damage and all kinds of things. And my husband, Steve, and I were in ICU with her for a number of days. And we had this joy and this peace that was incredible, that had come just knowing that we dedicated her to the Lord. So months go by after she was fine. She didn't have any any issues. And one day I was at a McDonald's with my sister-in-law, and Meredith was playing, and this woman came up to me, and she said, I know you. I'm like, I know you too. And we tried to figure it out. And finally she said, uh, I said, where do you work? And she told me the name of the hospital. I said, oh, I had my babies there. She said, no, I work in ICU. And I said, oh, I said, Meredith was in there. And she said, I knew it. She goes, I knew your smile and I knew your laugh, but I couldn't connect it until you said that. She said, I've never seen people in a situation like that joyful and laughing. And why is that? And I just went, because we prayed for her. And she said, oh. And I walked away, and I knew I blew it. I knew that God had given me an opportunity to make Christ known, and I had blown it. And I knew that I didn't want to do that again. And I think a lot of us will uh, you know, find ourselves in those situations and then be like, oh, God, you were inviting me to tell someone where my hope lies, and I blew it. So with that, I knew, okay, I'm not going to do that again. You know, the Bible says always be ready to, for, to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. So I was determined. So what I did was I decided that I would discover the best way for me to share the gospel. And I'm going to share that with you today. Number one, I'm going to go fast because we have a lot to cover and I don't want to miss out on the end of it. Uh, your partner is Christ. And I think we all know that. Jesus reached out to these disciples. He gathered these men together, and he said, I'm going to send you into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. And I love that he says in uh, John 15, 16, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you to go and bear much fruit and that your fruit will remain. Uh, And that word chosen means in history for this time. And I think we see that about the disciples, and we go, yeah, that was them, you know. But it's like they were just fishermen. They were just guys that Jesus chose to hold the light of the gospel in their generation. And in the same way, God's telling us, I've chosen you at this point in time in history for this purpose of making Christ known. I think it's real easy to raise really good kids and to be good people and to be in ministry. My husband's a pastor. And and miss the opportunity to just say, I want to go out and share this light, This give me a passion for it. Uh, if we truly knew the gravity of this that God is sending us, we would never get over our amazement that the God of the universe has chosen us to reveal, to live in a relationship with him and to partner with us to rescue lost souls. I think most of us probably know 2 Corinthians 5.20 that says that we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that's my heart. That's my, my longing is to raise up a generation, not of just good people that love Jesus, but that love him so much that what spills out of them is his 
his longing to see people come to Christ. So in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says that we are ambassadors for Christ. So if you can just remind yourself, I am an ambassador for Christ. Number two is my place. Your place is to follow after Christ. Jesus says, follow me. That word really means follow after me, which means to come here. Uh, it's your place is to follow after me is really what the true meaning. So Jesus is saying our place is to follow after him. Um, this is our chosen place and our posture that God has for us as ambassadors for Christ. And then my question is, are you fearful? Because I think it's really easy to, you know, in that situation, why did I not share with that ICU nurse? I was afraid I wouldn't say the right thing. I was afraid I would look goofy. I was afraid I would, you know, be like one of those people standing on the street corner, you know. And yet, because I wasn't prepared, I was fearful of the fear of man rather than, you know, when people are big and God is small, right? And so I knew uh, that I didn't want to be afraid anymore. And I thought about, remember Peter when he stood at that burning fire and the girl said, you, you know, you're one of his disciples. No, I'm not. And he denied Christ three times. Why? Because he was afraid. Yet later in Peter's story, he, when he, you know, Jesus, do you love me and feed my sheep and all that? And he comes back. And remember Jesus had said, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But when you return to me, and I love that. And some of you might have prodigals in here. But what I love about that story is that Jesus didn't say, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I'm going to rescue you. I'm not going to let you fall. He said, but I'm praying for you. And when you return to me, go. And I love knowing that when Peter came back, there was no stopping him. To the point, um, in one of my books, if my husband would change, I'd be happy, and other myths wives would leave. I told the love story of Peter and his wife, and here's the thing, that it's from Eusebius, that it's not even in the Bible. This is Eusebius' perception of what happened when Peter and his wife had both been arrested for their faith. And on the last day of their life, you know, and all Peter had to do was recant. Remember, that was the guy that was, you know, the cock crowed three times and he, he denied Christ. And in this moment, when his wife was being led away to be crucified, all that man had to do was say, we made it up. Jesus didn't rise, and yet he didn't. And what he says, I love this, is um, from Eusebius. The commitment of Peter and his wife to boldly pro proclaim what they witnessed of Jesus would eventually cost them their lives. Eusebius, a well-known Roman historian, made this observation of their final moments. The blessed Peter, seeing his own wife led away to execution, was delighted on account of her calling and return to her country, that he cried out to her, in a consolatory and encouraging voice, addressing her by name, Oh, thou remember the Lord. Such was the marriage of these two. I just can't even imagine. That's a secular historian that had this insight that this man loved his wife so much. And think about that last moment their eyes would have met and he watched her go to her death and he followed her. But where did that courage come from? He didn't have it before, but the spirit of the Most High God, when he was empowered by the spirit of God, there was no stopping him. Even to the point, I don't know about you, but I, I could see my husband dying for a cause, but to let me die for that, if it, it just verified Peter's testimony by watching his wife be led to her crucifixion. So the next point is your purpose is to know Christ and make Christ known. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 19, 10, John 20, 21, and Mark 16, 15. I love putting all those scriptures together. It's like that's what Jesus said to them. That's what he's saying to us. And we know it. We know it. But it's so easy to just not even run into anybody that doesn't know Jesus when we're working in ministry or we're in our safe, safe world. Uh, but honestly, how many of you have ever gone on a missions trip and you sit at a coffee shop and you just wait for God to bring someone to you that you can share the gospel with? But how often do we do that at home? Do we just go sit at a coffee shop and say, God, send somebody and I'll talk to them? But that's the normal Christian life. We shouldn't, I mean, mission trips are awesome, but our life should be a missions trip. If someone's bagging our groceries and they start telling you about how hard their day is, instead of saying, yeah, 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 no, I don't want a bag. I'm going to carry it all. I'm Californian. We have to pay for bags now. So I'm like, I got it. I got it. Instead of listening and, and, and paying attention and being watchful, and that's the next point under there, is be watchful. When Paul passed the baton to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 4, 5, be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. 
and be ready. Preach the word in season and out. 2 Timothy 4.2. Always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. And then consider your own story. We've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's what it says in Revelation 12.11. I think just knowing your own story. Um, you know, in the, in, I wasn't ready with my own story when this woman in ICU came and asked me, you know. Uh, and how about this? I think if we've been raised in the church or we've lived in the church bubble all, for a long time, it's easy to even be unmoved by our redemption, by our salvation. And sometimes I think it's stepping back and realizing who are you on your worst day? Who are you when you're not walking in the Spirit, when you're not fellowshipping with other believers that are going to call you on your, you know, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks, when you're not washed with the water of the Word? Who are you on your worst day? Now take that and put it on steroids, and that's who you would be without Christ. And let that be what humbles us and gives us our own story, even to our children. Mommy would be crazy without Jesus. Mommy would would be losing it on you right now without Jesus. Uh, So I think knowing our own story is powerful. Uh, And then really be ready to look for people in, in the everyday life. Sometimes people are on the top of their game. When um, my brother, I wanted to share the gospel with him so bad, and he came to visit us. We had planted a church in Austin, Texas, and he came to see me, and I was so ready. And we had 200 teenagers in our house every Wednesday night. We went from zero to 200 kids. They came to Christ. It was powerful. They were raised in the Bible Belt, but this Jesus that, that wanted a relationship with them, it was just super, super fun. And my brother came with his family and our house literally like teenagers putting cats on the ceiling fan. I mean, it was kind of crazy. And my brother likes his quiet and he eventually went to stay at my sister's house that was quieter. But he asked me, he called me a couple weeks later and he said, what was, your house was so peaceful. I'm like, bro, our house was crazy. But he saw something and, and I have shared the gospel with him before and I just said, I'll tell you, but you have to ask me. And he said, okay, why? So I was able to share it with him once again. And he didn't come to Christ, but my sister-in-law and I, she had just come to the Lord that year. We started praying for him. And the very next day, my sister-in-law called me and said, listen to this message. My brother's a mortgage banker. Don't judge him. He's a good guy. (laughs) And um, the message on their machine was from a guy. And we had prayed, God, just send a stranger, someone that has no baggage with him, someone that just, you know, you know how it is. It's like you can't tell your sibling, but someone that doesn't know him. And this message from a stranger said, hey, you know, we had lunch today. I just need to clarify, Rick, coming to know Christ is just this. And he laid out the gospel on their answering machine. And I'm just blown away. Two weeks later, my brother came to Christ. Isn't that cool? And I'm like, yay, God, you brought a stranger. And then in the moment of that, yay, God, was that, will you be that stranger? No, that's not my thing. Evangelism is not my spiritual gift. Um, Somebody else will do that. Uh, Send another stranger. And God would not let go of me with conviction until I agreed to be that stranger. But I was scared. So I was like, okay, I'll be the stranger, but you have to send people to me. I don't want to feel like I'm selling a multi-level marketing plan if you sell lots of levels, sorry. Um, But I just want to know those, you know, because you're not doing it on your own. God's doing a work in their heart. They've already been staying up at night wondering what life is about. At the top of their game, remember Lydia? She was a seller of purple. She was doing great. And she met Paul by the water because she was searching. And sometimes it's people at the bottom of their game. So not long after I had told God, I'll be that stranger, I was on an airplane and I was flying from Oakland to uh, University of North Florida. And Steve was supposed to fly with me. We were speaking at a youth camp and um, he ended up having to stay back and catch another flight. So my flight was going to be, my seat was going to be empty. And I was super happy because I was tired. We'd been doing camps all summer. And I had put a little living water Uh, devotional in my my bag. And I said, Lord, if you want me to give this to somebody, you know. And so in the moment that I sat down, a a pilot sat next to me. I'm like, yes, he's going to want to sleep. He wants to go home. And right before takeoff, they moved him and they put a giant man next to me. He, his head was practically, I mean, huge. And he had a bright red velour sweatsuit on. It's like neon sign. And he was a a player for the Seattle Supersonics, which I didn't know that at the time. I just knew he was giant. And um, as we started to take off, he tried to make conversation. And I really was like, literally had my head, my pillow, and he, and finally I'm like, okay, Lord. So I listened to him and he started talking about, he blew his knee out. He couldn't play anymore. He didn't know what he was going to do with his life. And see, that's where we have to listen for that point of entry. Why is this person telling me about their life? 
And what does God want me to share with them? Their need is always that they need a relationship with Christ. Whether their marriage is bad, whether they're having an illness, whatever that thing is, a lot of times we want to just, you know, give them an answer to fix that thing. And that the, the, we have to realize that God might be crumbling everything around you because he's drawing you to his son. So I shared with this gentleman the gospel and we had a great conversation. And in the end, I, get, I said, hey, I told him about my brother. And I said, I told God I would talk to anybody. And here's this. This is for you. Read it later. And then as I was getting off the plane, the woman sitting behind me tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, hey, I just want you to know I heard everything that you said. And I'm going to consider that. She said, my husband just gave me AIDS from a prostitute. And she said, and I'm trying to figure out what life's about. And I said, was I talking that loud? And two business in right up there turned around and said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then they said this, and we were praying. They were believers. Mm. Isn't it? Why am I crying? Isn't that the coolest? Don't you want to live like that? And that was, that I was hooked. I was like, okay, God, I, I can live like that. So being an ambassador for Christ means that we have to purge whatever keeps us from sharing Christ, you know, casting aside whatever sin so easily besets us. Um, I think that if our love for God is right, our love for people will be right. You know, Mark chapter 12, Jesus said the protos, the priority of life, is that you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, that's your whole being. What we want to do is love God with our strength. And God's like, slow down, Skippy. I don't need what you do. I need who you are to love me. And then what will spill out of you is what we do. I, I grew up in the church went to Christian schools, you know, a, a chapel speaker. How many of you shared the gospel this week? And you're like, well, I don't even know anybody that doesn't know Jesus because, you know. Uh, and it's not guilting you into sharing it. It's saying if the more I fall in love with God, the more his passion for lost souls will spill out of me and I'll get outside of myself and forget about my fear or my busyness or my whatever. I don't have the right words. And when you're loving God like that, think about Jesus when he's wept over Jerusalem. You know, I've longed to draw you to myself and you would not let me. And here's the thing, you don't have to seal the deal. It's not about getting them to pray the sinner's prayer. In fact, be careful if you do get them to pray the sinner's prayer because if they haven't truly made a covenant with Christ, you may be giving them hope in something that's not even genuine. But be ready to plant, be ready to water, be ready to pray for opportunities and keep your eyes open. And honestly, we have to lay aside what easily besets us. And that thing could be good stuff. You know, I was on the plane coming here and I was trying to review this and I had people on both sides of me and I like went in the zone and then I was like, how funny, I'm talking about sharing the gospel and there's two people sitting on the plane next to me and I'm not willing to talk to them. So I put this down and had conversations with those people. But sometimes we get so busy doing good stuff, right? And then having the patience to wait. Uh, we were at, um, I did a minister's wives retreat, which I love minister's wives ministry. And uh, we were coming back from the retreat and there was a couple of women that were with me and they wanted to stop at a Starbucks and have a, a cup of coffee or whatever. And one of the girls literally got two large frappuccinos and then they said, can we just sit here and drink them? And I'm like, besides the fact she'll have a brain freeze if she drinks those fast, we're gonna be here a while. And I just was ready to get home. So I sat in my chair, having a good attitude about it, or trying to, and then I said, okay, Lord, why am I here? And as we were visiting, I looked around and there was a couple sitting in the window, older couple, and the gentleman had on an Air Force cap. And I said, my son's a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Thank you for serving. And he was much older, uh, late 70s, I would guess. And his wife had a blanket over her lap. And so as we started to chat, then he, he said, you know, Eleanor just got out of the hospital. And she almost died. And he told me a little bit about her health issues. And I knew why I was there. And I turned to Eleanor and I said, you know what? My mother-in-law's name was Eleanor. I love that name. I said, I know I'm here to tell you you don't want to leave this wife life without having a relationship with my Savior. And I shared the gospel with her. Well, her husband, Lowell, went, went uh, military, you know, just sat very, while well, she listened. And I told her, this is the, you know, do you have a Bible? Read the book of John. Here's how to have a relationship with Jesus. And we said our goodbyes and we left. Prayed for her. We, we were doing a young marriage at our church at the time. We all prayed for, for Lowell and Eleanor. And what's fun about that story is probably six or eight months later, we were coming down from that same retreat center. And I walked in, and there was Lowell sitting in a chair. And I walked up to him, and I said, Lowell, do you remember me? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, how's Eleanor? And he went, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, we've been praying for you. And then Lowell 
was with a friend, his buddy. And see, that's the other thing you have to be careful of. Is you, you know, when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, he sent the guys out for pizza before he talked to her. He's like, guys, I'm hungry. Go get a like, pita because in the Middle East. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to talk to this woman who has a shameful past, and she doesn't need a bunch of religious-looking Jewish men looking down on her. And he, and he said, I have to go through Samaria. He made an appointment, a divine appointment, to talk to this woman. And I think we have to be careful, too, that we don't embarrass people. So I wanted to talk more to Lowell, but he was with his buddy. So I went and sat down with the women I was with, and I prayed for this opportunity to continue the conversation. And you know, old men pee a lot. So when his buddy got up to go to the bathroom for the third time, he <laughs> sorry, he comes up to me to say goodbye. And I said, no, 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 you get a hug. And I got up. He's like 6'4". And I, I hugged him, and I looked up at him, and I said, Lowell, it's not an accident that I saw you today. I've been praying for you. So do you remember what I told Eleanor, and I again shared the gospel with him. I said, I don't know if she surrendered her heart to Christ, but I do know if she did. And he was crying, and I was crying. I'm crying now. I said, if she did, I know she's with the Lord, and I know that God made a divine appointment for me to meet you here today. This place is not in my town. This 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 is a Starbucks in the middle of who knows where. And if you don't like Starbucks, sorry, but you know, it's the woman at the well. You know, <laughs> Jesus didn't like Samaria, but he went there <laughs> anyway. And um, and I shared with him, and he left, and I've never seen him since. But I know that he heard the gospel twice. And I know that God can do you know, whatever he wants to do with that word that's planted. But we have to pay attention. We have to say, here am I, send me. Uh, in the year that I, my first book that I wrote for Harvest House Publishers is called Moms Raising Sons to Be Men. I'm going to do an interview about that later today. And that year that I was writing, I was convicted because I was home a lot because I was, I'm not a writer, so it took me a long time. And... I was like, Lord, I want to share the number with X amount of people this year. And it was a large number. And as I started to make, and it couldn't be in the church, you know, because my husband's a pastor and the church isn't your salvation station, in case you're wondering. That's where you do the work of the ministry to edify the body to send them out to do the work. So it was like, it has to be in the highways and the byways, Lord. And as I got to a certain number, I was convicted that I was counting, like, you know, when David got in trouble for numbering the people. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm not even going to pay attention. You know the number. I just want, please give me those many opportunities. The end of that year, Steve and I had to go to Harvest House to talk about the next opportunity that they were going to give me to write, and they were talking about Moms Raising Sons. And I said, you know, how's it doing? How many books is it selling? And actually, Steve asked that. And they said, actually, it's selling a 1,000 copies a month. And I'm like, really? Moms are desperate for mentors. And in the back of all of my books, I put how to have a relationship with Jesus. And then Steve said, where's the number one place it's selling? And then Bob Hawkins, president of Harvest House, said, in the secular market. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't. I wanted this number. You know, the Bible says that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. I don't even know how many non-believing women picked up that book and read in the back of it. The first chapter will tell you if you want to know more, know about having a relationship with Jesus, go to the back. So you don't even know. If you just make yourself available, you don't even know how God is going to send you. And I love Acts chapter uh 17.6, that it says, these who have turned the world upside down are here. Can that, let that be said of us. In this generation, let that be said of us. A couple of stories that I absolutely love. Ravi Zacharias, is, he's a well-known apologist. He was in India at 17 years old. He attempted suicide. When he was in the hospital, a man he did not even know gave him an English New Testament. His mom helped him read it and translated it into English, and Ravi gave his heart to Christ and became a great apologist that we know today. The man and Ravi have been lifelong friends. Before the man died, he told Ravi, I believe leading you to Christ was the sole purpose of my life, and listening to you preach is my greatest joy. And then I love the story of D.L. Moody's Sunday school teacher, Ed, Edward Kimball. That's probably a better well-known story. You know, he felt compelled. He was awkward, uncomfortable. He felt compelled to go to this 18-year-old where he was working at a shoe store and share the gospel with him. And as he did, I love uh, D.L. Moody's, in, in what he said is, I recollect my teacher came around behind the counter of the shop and he put his hand on my shoulder and he talked to me about Christ and my soul. I had not felt that I even had a soul until then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here is a man who never saw me till lately and he's weeping over my sins and I never shed a tear for them. But I understand now and know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and weep over their sins. I don't remember what the man, his Sunday school teacher said, but I can feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder tonight. It was not long after that I was brought into the kingdom. 
this man was nervous. He paced. He missed the, when he walked around the shoe store, he was nervous to go talk to this 18-year-old and share the gospel, but he felt constrained. He felt compelled to do so. Spurgeon says, I would stir you all up to be instant in season and out of season in telling out the gospel message. Whisper it in the ear of the sick, shout it in the corner of the streets, write it on your tablet, but everywhere let this be your great motive and warrant. And again, talking about that picture, that picture, that cross, yeah, we cling to that cross, but are we willing to cling to that cross and hold our hand out to someone else who's drowning? And that's my passion, that's my heart, and uh, that's where I'm going to leave it with you guys. I just I pray that God does a, a work in all of us to keep us inspired and just passionate about it. Thank you.